good morning one and all uh, i hope all of you are doing safe i would like to briefly introduce myself dr nirali sangvi sub coordinator of maharashtra state welcome to the webinar on understanding ndt and bobat i would like to take the privilege of in short briefing about iap women cell it was started on 30th of may 2018 it functions under the guidance of national head dr ruchi vashne and executive president dr sanjeev jha iapwc works towards conducting public awareness cmes workshops it aims at bringing together all the pt professionals for sharing knowledge recent advances and improving public awareness about physiotherapy we have five zones in india with heads for each zone Dr. Pooja Kamle heads the West Zone. The Maharashtra State Team. We have Dr. Suvarna Ganvir as the State Coordinator, Dr. Snehal Patel as the State Joint Coordinator, and Sub Coordinators Dr. Uttara Mohan, Dr. Priya Karande, and myself, Dr. Nirali Sangvi. Here, I would also like to take the privilege to introduce our very well-known and renowned. Professor Dr. Dharam Pandey. He has been a a great professor. Uh, Dr. Dharam Pandey has received his PhD degree in Rehab Sciences and presently working as director and head of the department at BLK Super Specialty Hospital, New Delhi. He is actively involved in various researches on stroke, balance disorders, critical care, and many more. he conducted various health talks camps and corporate workshops in topics of ergonomic he has taken workshops nationally and internationally on the topics of stroke balance disorders and neuromyokinetic dysfunctions he is also one of the promoters for pro seed foundation in india he holds numerous professional memberships and also certificates he has achieved many awards he has 46 academic workshops taken till now and more than 100 health talks he is a great therapist clinician academician and a researcher without any further ado i would request dr dharam sir to please take over the session thank you thank you dr nirali for such a uh, elaborated and uh, uh, nice introduction welcome and, sir uh, Uh, first of all thanks to iap women cell maharashtra chapter for uh, inviting me on this platform so that i can share my uh, knowledge to you uh, sharing uh, the live webinar and making you understand <clears throat> i have tried my best to make you uh, learn through this from the distance and uh, hope i'll be able to make your uh, time uh worthy you are here for uh, another one hour with me so uh, let me share my screen here uh, and start the session so can you see my screen now snehal sir yes yes sir so uh, we are here today to uh, discuss about the ndt and bobat concept what is uh, ndt bobat uh, we'll look at how the ndt evolved over the year what are the changes has been taken place and few of techniques also i'll uh, try to make you understand through video here because we cannot have a certain uh, advantage of uh, having hands on uh, training but definitely i have tried uh, with some of videos to make you understand okay so Uh, when we talk about bobat and ndt there are two word bobat concept and ndt it comes in uh, everyone's mind and uh, we think that uh, is that bobat and ndt is different suddenly it comes in mind so i would like to make sure here that bobat and ndt came from the same root so there is nothing uh, different there uh, when bobat started Uh, teaching the and developed the bat concept and it was very successful in europe and she was uh, invited to travel to us and uh, teach this technique 
but there was as per policy in uh, united states um, that anything cannot be named on uh, somebody's uh, name so they developed is a uh, based on its uh, scientific background and something like neurodevelopmental therapy so it is in all over except us it is called bobak concept and some of them uh, yes it is so it is it has a both has a same root bobak um, Uh, made an uh, Bobath Instructor Association in 1984, and uh, in US there was an, another organization formed called NDTA, the, the, that is the Neurodevelopmental Therapy Association, which is located in the US. So first thing you you keep it in your mind that um, there is no such difference in between, but of course they have developed their own uh, definitions and. Uh, in, Their, their their philosophy, but it is all same. So once you look at uh, their definition, I'll read about for you here, and you can also read. One thing you you will find a common in both the definition that the movements, the posture, holistic in nature, and uh, movement control activity participation. There are few things you will find common. and this is how it makes uh, uh, both the concept uh, same okay let us understand its rational and and extract something from its uh, uh, core uh, definition so what we find is ndt bobat concept is in a holistic in nature it is based on evolving research in neurosciences new researches are coming and it is it is keep uh, um, changing its its dimension it is a patient centric uh, uh, approach to neuro neurological impairment it is a problem solving approach it is based on movement analysis we analyze the movement and uh, make uh, under, understand the functional limitations and we accordingly make a treatment strategy utilization of sensory information that is also there so these are the few things which you can extract from uh, the both the definitions so you have to remember that these are the uh, ndt bobat is a holistic therapy it is a, it is based on a various uh, uh, evolving neurosciences research it is a patient centric approach it is problem solving approach it based on movement analysis it, it uses the sensory information and sensory inputs to train your patient and make them functionally independent and it, it it has a very very strong base on posture it says that when if if there is no stability you cannot gain mobility right so let us just understand a bit of uh, 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 history about that we all know that it came from bobat's uh, husband and wife berta bobat she was an, a remedial gymnast and later she become a physical therapist and carol bobat he was in a psychiatrist basically and they did a lot of research on this and they got married on 1941 while treating a person called simon elvis in 1943 he simon was in a um, uh, player in the musician kind of thing and she was treating and she was handling in a very different way and see found that there is a some changes a positive changes in his functional activity the way she was treating and this is where the journey started okay and they both husband wife did so much of research they found bobat center they found evita mental illness bobat instructor to association in 1984 and this is how it keep evolving um, time to time the new research came in and new theory motor control theory another theory uh, was coming up and the time to time it got uh, evolved and what today we have is a, is a, is a very uh, new and very uh, very transformed ndt actually okay so now let's move on to uh, understand uh, how uh, this ndt and or therapy is helps us so when we talk about neurological impairment 
whenever there is a neurological insult, what happens? What happens when there is a neurological insult? So when we think about that, you can just look at that there are functional loss. Whenever there is a neurological impairment, there is a functional loss. That means, uh, what is function here? All the ADLs we do day to day, walking, bathing, dressing, and all these things get disturbed. Right? So, if you can see here, Dr. Snell, can you mute? Somebody has a, and there is a lot of, uh, I think she is working in kitchen. Okay. Sir, I'm checking. Yeah. So somebody is working in kitchen and listening to me. <laughs> Very funny. Okay. So, uh, 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 when we talk about in neurological impairment and function loss, if any function loss is uh, due to abnormality in movement, right? And when you talk about movement, movement is not itself uh, is results a function. Okay, there is a series or sequence of movement. There is a lot of uh, movement and sequence. Uh, which required to complete in a function. Like in, in on your screen, if you can see, Snehal, there is somebody, 8DCCC is uh, unmuted. Yes, sir, done. Yes, done. right, thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, on your screen, you can see that a girl is trying to uh, jump on a hurdle. And if you talk about function, so function here is to jump. But once you see from the first uh, uh, pic picture to last picture, you can see there is a lot of movement sequences required. There is a movement at hip, there is a movement at uh, shoulder, there is a movement at ankle, hip, knee, everywhere, even in the entire body. Okay, so these sequences are very, very important to accomplish and a completion of tasks. So remember that this is the core function is result of series of movements. We should have an, a good sequencing of movement and only the functional movement is executed. So how normal movements executed? There should have an, a very effective biomechanical sequencing. There has to be very good soft tissue interaction there. There has to be very effective motor planning. Right? So all these three components, like you should have in a very soft tissue interaction. Uh, like in a spastic muscle, there's a contracted muscles. There cannot be a good movement execution. We'll look at that uh, later on. So what current theory development and, and how this processing takes place? Just look at this slide. So when we uh, think about doing something, we perceive, like for example, here in this picture, you can see that a person is perceiving that a glass of water is on the table and he wants to hold it, right? So this is the perception and that is taking place in uh, our limbic system with the memory and everything that, okay, there's a glass, there are a lot of uh, planning takes place in associated cortex and limbic system that, okay, this is the uh, water, half of water or full glass of water, how much it weighs, how uh, much I have to hold it, how much power I have to generate, all these kind of section things, planning takes place very fast. And that, based on that planning, the, the three most important components of our brain react. Like cerebellum has to uh, plan for execution of movement in terms of how much distance, how much tone, and all these things are planned by accuracy is uh, the cerebral. The motor cortex generate the power in the skeletal muscle through its corticospinal tract via basal ganglia. And via basal ganglia, has an, uh, it acts like a, an, a stabilizer. So if there is a more tone, it will reduce. If it is less tone, it will enhance something kind of that function is vessel ganglia and accuracy of movement. And that impulses are passed through spinal cord and musculoskeletal system act and the person holds the glass in hand. 
So this is uh, the sequence. But when we talk about these uh, neurophysiological approaches, this is not the end. There are a lot of things which are at periphery, like tactile, proprioception, visual, and joint positions, uh, in feedbacks. And these feedbacks are keep going to the cortex, cerebellum, and at its mind, spinal cord level to have a certain reflexes. So this is how a movement takes place. And if there is a, any inaccuracy, if there is, it is not efficient, then very quick modification in such uh, tonic activity, muscle activity takes place. So this loop you have to remember that the perception, the planning, the program, movement occur, and that movement is refined with uh, uh, peripheral feedback. Okay. So I uh, hope you have understood that how the movement sequencing takes place, right? And this is what is uh, uh, dysfunctional in NDT, uh, any neurological impairment. And with the NDT and Bobat concept, we try to use the sensory. Uh, advantage, sensory system advantage to treat, um, uh, restore the function back. So what are the changes has been taken place? As I said, and Bobath said that the uh, Bobath concept is not a static. It is a dynamic. It will keep changing till it exists and it is going to exist forever. So what are the changes has been taken place so far? So uh, in historical approach, initially we used to uh, believe in hierarchical model, uh, like first uh, the brain will act, then the, the hierarchical model of uh, uh, motor control theory. And now we believe in system model and neuroplasticity has emerged and we are using that analytical model. We analyze, we make an, a hypothesis of our uh, assessment, I will tell you uh, later on. Initially, we used to utilize the developmental sequence. So it, it is no more uh, practiced in NDT that it is not necessary that you have to train first to, to you know, roll down, you have to train first to um, sit down and then standing and then walking. It is no more practiced in NDT. We can, uh, there is an interference and uh, transparency practice. If you train trunk, there may be gait may get improved. And if you train gait, the trunk may get improved. So earlier we used to uh, believe that the movement is carried, uh, executed uh, and expected to spontaneous carry over into function. Like if you have a good strength, if you are able to uh, flex your um, elbow, uh, you, you can do certain activity, but it is no more uh, now. Now we believe in task specific functional approach. If somebody has a good strength, but uh, not able to walk, then it is no use. We, we, we want to make person functional. So that is what being changed. Initially also, we had a very uh, emphasis, emphasize the postural alignment. Now also emphasize uh, postural alignment. And initially we used to handling inhibition facilitation techniques. Yes, the, 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 on the key point, but yes, we also um, practice in the same way, but now uh, in, in more NDT and nowadays, we find limitation and with the taking advantage of uh, sensory uh, channels, uh, we, we try to uh, re-educate the motor functions and, and correct the limitations what we are finding out. So it is more, more towards motor uh, learning theory. It is moving towards more towards motor learning theory. Earlier also we had a positioning uh, emphasis. Now also we have positioning, um, but it is changed in a way that we used to had uh, positioning in a reflex inhibition posture. Okay. Now we assist patient voluntary. We, we focus more on voluntary control rather having passive approach. Practice sensory motor experience. Yes, you do pra practice uh, sensory motor experience nowadays, but it is in functional in nature. So what we look at here is, and what we understand here is that we are moved from a passive kind of uh, approach to an, a very, very active kind of approach. And now we more believe in function oriented therapy 
and whatever uh, the functional limitations are we solve that try to solve that problem right development it over the year there are a lot of developments in neurosciences biomechanics and motor learning control theories a lot of theories came and with the understanding of these biomechanical uh, advances and neurosciences advantage advances motor control motor learning theories a lot of theories came uh, from since in in 19th uh, century so uh, now now what we believe in theory and and, and it, it, with the these theory and these research came up in our science and the entity keeps changing its um, uh, scenario so now we believe in a something called neuroplasticity and uh, it is a very recent concept which is uh, uh, emerging and we take this uh, plastic changes in ability to change our brain and uh, we try to uh, train people with that okay so we we started to know there are a lot of work done by nudo and in 90s and still there a uh, lot of evolving things coming in field of neuroplasticity before we talk about neuroplasticity let me explain first how brain recover after injury this is the foundation if you understand this then we can understand better how we can train people right so neurolog any brain insult any neurological impairment any whenever there is a injury to brain it it recover in two ways one is neurological recovery and that is driven by uh, uh spawn it it is it can be called as a spontaneous recovery if you don't do anything it is it is more driven by uh, pharmacological agents and spontaneous activity uh, which is giving you must have seen that if somebody has a stroke initial days some recovery spontaneously it comes but what we are interested here is to have a functional recovery if somebody has a uh, survived uh, out of icu they are at home and they are not functional there is no use for like that life what we want here is to uh, regain the function we want to restore the function recovery and that this is where we as a physiotherapist um, exist as a moment science specialist and how the functional recovery takes place is uh, as a result of cns reorganization remember i repeat cns reorganization yes you hear the right way that cns can reorganize and it is influenced well known that it is influenced by rehabilitation process and the key factor here is neuroplasticity so let us understand what is neuroplasticity neuroplasticity is a flexible property of brain to change temporarily or permanently it is a potential of brain to react adopt changes based on outside and inside in there are a lot of research has been done that how uh, the neuroplasticity check take place uh, there are uh, some uh, molecular level changes there are some chemical changes there are glutamate something called glutamate it it, it causes uh, something uh, neuronal excitability it increases excitability there are things but we are going to talk here is activity dependent is called activity dependent uh, neuroplasticity what it is neural network you must be aware that how the neural network get created so the one neuron and one neuron dendrites and they make an a synaptic connections like this there is a pre synaptic membrane there is a post synaptic membrane and these two membrane uh, uh, exchange there is a some chemical uh, activity there and this is how the impulses from one neurons to other neuron uh, get passed travel from one neuron to another neuron and this is how the impulses uh, travel in uh, nervous system and once you uh, look at that as a, as a whole if you look at that not at a single neuron there is a million and trillions of neurons in our brain so if, if you will have something like this kind of structure here so the one neuron is attached with another neuron so something like this you will get um, a structure in your brain if you look at 
in a 3D image of this, it is something looks like this. It is, there are cell bodies and they are connected to each other in a way that there are multiple connections. They are, they are connected, one cell is connected to, uh, uh, through its dendrites and exons. They are connected to uh, different cells, right? So this is how the 3D image looks in a neuronal map, neuronal network in your brain. Okay. So with understanding of that, we can say that the, now the brain is not a hardwired structure. It is not hardwired structure. It is, uh, it, 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 its neural network can be remapped, reorganized, right? Like for example, I'll tell you one example here that uh, like for example, if you are uh, 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 practicing and trying to learn piano, okay? So the first day you will start learning, there'll be no map in your brain. Uh, you have to look at the key, you have to press that, uh, like how we used to understand the uh, riding a bicycle or writing, you used to do mistake and the accurate motor behavior were not emerging. So same way, when we try to learn piano, we, we used to think, decide which key I'm going to press and what happens after, uh, at, at that type point of time, there is no neuronal map in your brain. But when you keep trying, keep practicing, your finger muscles, your shoulder, your hand muscles are so uh, tuned that it get automatic. Soon you perceive, and soon you think you, your cortex is active, your cerebellum is active in, and it becomes an automatic function while talking also you can play uh, piano. So this is how the neuronal map get created for each activity. The, the things we practice more, that uh, representation to that part, like for example, I'm, I'm, I'm writing or typing or something activity, my hand, area in my, in my brain, the neuronal uh, map will get more stronger. It will acquire more space in my brain to, to execute these functions. So this is how your synapses get strengthened when, when, when you do practice. Let me explain you in a very simple way, very, very late terminology. We used to go to clinic, we used to go to any destination every day, right? So what we do, we take an particular path. If, you're, uh, if your uh, parents or anybody say that you go there and you take something from the shop uh, nearby. So what will you go? You will uh, travel, your um, take a lift, go down. You know that a path, this is the path is uh, taking you to a milk shop, a, uh, something shop or nearby mall. This is how you have to go. This is the way you go. Right. But what happens when, when there is a something problem happens in between and you keep finding that there is a problem. So what will happen? You will try to find out something new pathway. Yes, it was in existence, but you were not aware about that. That yes, I can go in that way also because you have not never tried because you were not forced. Okay. So so first you will have trouble, you will say your parents or anybody that, no, I can't go, there is no way. Yes, but if you are forced to, then you will look for something, to way to reach and execute that function. Same way, like you will try to find an, another way. It may be longer path, it may be a shorter path, it may be uh, something uh, uh, difficult than... Uh, the earlier how it was, but definitely you will find the way to reach to your destination. So this is how your brain also functions. Okay. So when you keep forcing your cortex, you keep forcing, keep firing to neurons with the help of activity and guidance and taking advantage of sensory inputs, definitely there'll be more synaptic connections will develop. I'll tell you how it occurs, the principles, but in a three way, this recovery takes place in three way. That is called axonal sprouting, synaptic strengthening and activation of weak pathway, right? 
So exonal sprouting is something like uh, uh, more dendrite right formation, more synaptic connections are getting. And synaptic strengthening is something there is a synapses are there and they get uh, uh, strengthened. There are still existing weak pathways which were not used and they get activated. So this is how the brain recovered. Okay. There are two terms you have to remember is a potentiation and depression when we talk about this any neurological uh, recovery. So potentiation by the word itself, you can understand that there is something to enhance and depression is something to depress, something to decrease. So what happens when we uh, do a task practice, a repeated practice? And there is a pre-synaptic connection, there is a post-synaptic connection, neurons, right? So when we start firing, we force the neurons. Here, force means if you want to uh, strengthen your biceps, what will you do? You will do an, an dumbbell or you, you will have an, a something um, heavy object in your brain, uh, if you, in your hand, and you will start uh, um, doing something activity with that. So this is how you strengthen your uh, biceps. But here in brain, it is not, there is no hand. We can't give hand uh, uh, dumbbells to neurons and, and, and do strengthening. So how you are going to... Um, strengthen those and how you're going to enhance the firing with the repetitions and giving a challenging activity and practice. So you, you like, so for example, uh, you are a very lazy person and I keep pushing, you know, you have to wake up, wake up, wake up. You have to go, go. So this is how I can excite you, make you excite to do something. So this is how uh, we can stimulate the cortex. Now there are technologies also exist to, uh, stimulate the synapses in brain. So this is what potential is. So when there is a uh, more of more inputs we send through sensation, sensory, taking help of sensory uh, feedback, there'll be a lot of chemical reactions and exchange at membrane. And the response will be increased. The post-synaptic response will be increased. And this is how the synapses get strengthened. The weak synapses get strengthened. And the result is, this is the transient process. And that, if it is keep going, what will happen? There will be a lot of exonal. There were less of connections to two neuronal cells. But now, with this keep repeated stimulation, there will be a lot of uh, uh, new connections will develop. And the more the connections develop there, the more the strengthen and more the accurate Im, uh, impulses will be uh, passed through that. And that becomes structural changes. And that is what called synaptic sprouting. Okay. Hope you understand the potentiation. So more stimulation we give, we try to give more stimulation to cortex, the more response. And that more response is uh, giving the more synaptic sprouting. And this is what the activity dependent, we, we, there, there are passive approach also, but here, if you do activity, there'll be strengthening in synaptic, there'll be synaptic sprouting. There, in contrast to that, when we don't use, if you don't use, if you don't do any movement, if you don't use your body part, which is uh, actually happened in uh, neuro post neurological impairment, so there will be less firing at uh, synapses. And when there is a less firing of synapses, the response will be less. And when response is less, synapses undergo inhibition. So we don't use, we are going to lose. Okay. And the result is the existing connections also, because brain will understand that, oh, there is a no use for these uh, structures. So it will start pruning. Okay, so there will be very less connectivity between two cells, and that is called synaptic pruning. Okay, so two things you remember more excitement will give exonal um, sprouting, and less activity at the synapse will have a synaptic pruning. So, this is how it becomes poor. So, this is just animation to make understand that how the impulses are traveling. It is, it is, it is not in a one way. If we use in a synapse more frequently, it is going to strengthen and it become stronger. 
and when we don't use certain uh, neuronal network we don't uh, excite them at all we don't use them that neuronal connection is going to weak so we have to strengthen your brain it, it is a very normal phenomena we say that if you want to improve your writing what you have to do you have to keep writing practice writing if you want to become expert in certain motor uh, task we have to become we have to keep practicing that particular motor task like the players the sports players they keep practicing gymnasts they keep practicing there and they are able to maintain their balance on a very narrow base and they have so stronger extra pyramidal system they have so much strong uh, antagonist agonist activities that in a very nanoseconds their uh, co contraction is occurring like for example see we stand in a very uh, smaller uh, base of support we will have tendency to fall but a gymnast can have that because with the practice their contraction level co contraction antagonist agonist and synergistic muscles are so contracting into an in synchronization that soon their uh, base of support their line of gravity is falling out of base their muscle get contract and protect them falling but what happens in our case in normal case when we stand on a narrow base of support and 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 we lose and our center of gravity is just uh, going out of base we will take time to uh, take get reaction of antagonist and agonist to control and pull our body within the center of food. gravity and we will have we will have fall so this is how when you use more it is going to strengthen if you don't use you are going to lose okay right moving further so now we can understand that the task oriented training is the best part of ndt and the functional training is a very very important in and what is task specific training is a systemic way of repetition of certain tasks so hope you understand the basic concept how the concept right so now coming to the core how we assess patient when we uh, in keeping in mind that uh, concept of ndt or bobat so ndt bobat concept emphasizes the hypothesis based clinical reasoning and assessment uh, complaint with you that yes they are not able to walk or they are walking their locomotion is impaired so that is the functional activity like locomotion walking gait okay so when you start assessing that functional activity what you are going to look the quantity what the quality how and and why why this person is moving in that way what is this functional why why this person is not walking Uh, if somebody has suffered a stroke head injury or anything why this person is walking in that way what is lacking why he is not walking like me okay so the what is he is not able to walk efficiently he he is not walking uh, as normal but you will try to look at that why he is not walking in that way that means he has he may have some muscle um, poorly activated him some of muscles are not working uh, his posture is not in that way his brain is not giving that command so all these questions will come in mind right let us understand in a more detail so the first thing what we do in assessment process we try to identify the functional limitations where the functional limitation is yes so somebody is coming to you and they have functional limitation is inability to walk or uh, inefficient walking pattern right so what will you have you will have an uh, you will make an uh, hypothesis in your self that okay so this person may be uh, uh, not able to walk because his trunk is not stabilized maybe he is not getting uh, a good stance this is why he is not able to walk he is not having dorsiflexors activated so he is not able to Uh, walk efficiently and he is hip hiking something kind of hypothesis you will make okay so when you so make hypothesis you will follow up, go and observe the current impairment how the person 
uh, what the impairment person has okay and you will make an uh, and you decide that the most significant impairment that person has okay so you have to go sequence by sequence so once you refine your hypothesis like for for example you make an hypothesis and you are refining your hypothesis there is two way you don't get confused the first thing you look at the functional limitations and soon you look at that functional limitation you find that yes this person has walking difficulty and there may be so many problems then you will make him do the activity and observe you should have a very very great observational skill to understand the uh, uh, impairment so once you do retesting walking make the person walk and observe you may find that okay no you were thinking that the trunk is not impaired because his stance is not taking place this is why his gait is uh, poor so you you have to refine your hypothesis in your assessment and accordingly you will make an a strategy for treatment you will make a goal that okay i am going to work on his stance to to make his stance control in a more effective and after that <clears throat> you will look at that if i do this technique or this way i am going to achieve that his stance is uh, good control and he will be uh, you will anticipate that his walking pattern is going to be normal and towards normal maximum towards normal then again if you look at that no this is not going to work you may have some changes uh, necessary time to time every day while treating and you will look at also that is there any further uh, additional intervention needed like treadmill you want to make him walk on treadmill do you want any uh, other gadgets like fes or other things to assist your uh, treatment okay so this is how you have to move on and ultimately you will test your hypothesis that that is something nothing but uh, testing your goal that whether your goal is achieved so uh, why i am explaining this the ndt bobat concept believe and emphasize the hypothesis based assessment and clinical reasoning you you assess a patient uh, in a way that the functional assessment you do perform the normal things history medical history all you do and after that you do in a functional assessment real time functional assessment you find the impairment where it is make your hypothesis that this problem is because of this if something is not uh, Uh, perfect then there is a hypothesis you make an hypothesis that this problem is because of this and you try to solve it this is why it is problem solving so if somebody has a problem in trunk their gait may be disturbed so you could correct that solve that problem the gait will be improved if somebody has a dysfunction at uh, shoulder and he is not able to perform his hand activity you will make an hypothesis that i am going to um, Uh, correct his scapular pattern movement pattern at shoulder and you will solve that problem and the, uh, his function will be more uh, towards normal so this is why it is problem solving approach okay so it is problem solving approach it believes in hypothetical um, um, uh, assessment and clinical reasoning and taking advantage of your all neurological and sensory inputs to train that queuing and other things right let us understand here things how how you proceed so here the first person comes you look at the trunk and base of support because we believe that stability is the key for mobility so when the trunk is not stabilized the posture is not aligned the person is not going to walk properly he will have some trick he will have some disturbances in gait so ob you should have an, a very good uh, observational skill observation and analysis of patients line of gravity and which neuro here you have to find that which neuromuscular activity must this patient should recruit like for example some muscles are not getting recruited some muscles are inhibited some muscles are not uh, activated this is why there is a deviation there is a leaning 
there is a side lateral leading uh, leaning or front leaning or some dysfunctional posture or stability so if you find that you will be able to correct that i will tell you later on so if, more accurately if you can see here in this so once you go for assessment you will find that his base of support is on left hip more or not on right so his muscles are not active at some extent at the side muscles lateral muscles so we have to train this guy in that way so this is how you do observational assessment of your patients and after that you have to look as a whole the relationship of your pelvis you you saw the base of support pelvis and head now you have to look at the relationship between shoulder pelvis pelvis legs shoulder arm and all these relationship you will find out and find that where is the problem one problem like for example if the person is uh, giving you hand using hand for balance okay so he 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 is not having problem at his hand he is having problem it as it pelvis his pelvis and pelvis is not stabilized this is why he is trying to his center of uh, gravity is falling outside his leg so he is trying to his hand to make a wider uh, uh, putting his center of gravity within the leg within the limit so that he can make balance right so this is how you have to look at as a whole it is not that if somebody has walking has impaired and it is not that the one problem is only in legs or pelvis it may be somewhere else also so this is why it is a, a holistic treatment it is a holistic approach it is not that we look at the single component we have to examine a, a patient as a whole and whole totally we have to treat there may have some sensory input there may have some cognition problem there may have some other uh, coordination issues we have to look the patient as a whole it is not that uh, uh, particular place let's have an example here of uh, sit to stand okay so whenever you treat patient with ndt concept or then you should have a very good observational skill you should have a very good knowledge of what is normal so let us talk about sit to stand sit to stand is a function we all know that it is a function okay so when we talk about sit to stand there are certain um, uh, sequencing and normal sequencing sit to stand involve something called flexion momentum movement transfer extension and stabilization these are the phases required to have an efficient sit to stand let's look at in this picture video you can see that there is a person is creating a flexion movement okay so first flexion movement is created and that flexion movement is transferred through the feet <clears throat> to the ground okay and then at the beginning here you can see again let me play this video okay this is the flexion momentum and flexion momentum is transferred to knee feet and extension and now it is stabilization and you can see in this picture the flexion momentum is created the momentum is transferred to uh, the base and then the person is Uh, standing and there is a extension activity and trunk and then and uh, finally it get stabilized within the base of support and we stand and the same thing reverse from standing to sitting right and in, in, in next picture if you see that there is a poor movement transfer there is a poor extension mechanism so this person is not able to perform an efficient sit to stand behavior look at this picture he is not able to create sufficient moment transfer he is not able to create an sufficient momentum so that he can transfer the momentum through his feet otherwise he must have a good sit to stand look at another another video here what is happening here 
he is not able to have an efficient first step, the moment momentum transfer. This is why when we practice, there has to be a moment transfer. You 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 try today. The sitting without moment creating momentum trans flexion momentum, and you try to stand, you will fall. You will not be able to stand because you should have an, a momentum transfer because your whole body weight has to be taken on your base, right? So this is this is what we are going to observe. So this person has a problem with sit to stand, and the what hypothesis we have made is this person has a lack of momentum flexion momentum and flexion momentum transfer so if we regain that and we do practice that if we achieve he will be independently able to sit perform sit to stand so this is how we make an end. testing hypothesis assess clinical reasoning and we do uh, make our plan Okay, so let us understand something uh, uh, practical treatment strategy, uh, and 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 we'll take an mobility like gait here to better understand because gait is a little easier to understand. Okay, okay. So before that, we just le let us understand what is various phases of gait in a very brief. We all know that there are uh, different gait patterns: heel strike, contact, so like. Just I'll brief which muscles are getting activated at what stage. You can see that the muscles are highlighted. So when you heel strike, your muscles, your gluteal muscles are eccentrically contracting to have a good heel strike and, and dorsiflexors. Tibialis anterior is active and gluteal is active. Once you uh, start loading, your uh, plantar fracture is making your ankle rigid and counter force and your quadriceps is activated. And in mid stance, you can see that there is no muscle activity. Your plantar flexor is a very strong muscle, which make you keep yourself in strong. So this is how you can see that how your muscles are activated. And when you start pre-swing, your rectus femoris and your quadriceps is eccentrically contracting. Okay, and soon you uh, start lifting your leg in swing. Your hamstring is concentrically active, and your um, quadriceps is eccentrically active. Okay, so same thing repeated, and this is how your gait is achieved. We know that there is a sixty percent of stance and only forty percent of swing. Okay, and in that more of that, you know that. There is a push off phase, and only 10 10 percent in entire gait cycle. There is a only 20 percent is double limb support, the rest 80 percent time is single limb support. So, remember that if somebody is having problem in coordination or in uh, dysfunction in leg, he will not be able to perform uh, that achieve that 80 percent of gait and this is how the gait is dysfunctional uh, before that further moving uh, let us have an, a quick look on what are the determinants of gait so there are four determinants of gait one is there is there has to be a pelvic rotation there has to be a pelvic list which is also called dip and there is, has to be in a stance knee flexion and ankle foot interaction let us see one by one Okay, so this is one. When we uh, <coughs> take our limb for heel strike, there is a pelvic rotation. Pelvic rotate forward. Okay, pelvic rotate forward. So if, if this is the pelvis, pelvis, this pelvis rotate forward. Okay, making your limb lengthen because once your leg on standing, if your legs are not lengthen enough you will not have a perfect heel strike, okay? And the same time, your pelvis little dips down again. So make your one leg is lengthened so that you can touch the ground on heel, okay? There is uh, dorsiflexion has to be there so that 
when you do dorsiflexion your calcaneus is uh, going forward and further making your limb lengthen enough to because the where you are standing here and the other leg is going down so this leg has to be more uh, uh, length and this is why in the stance leg there has to be a 5 to 10 degree stance flexion is during a stance knee flexion so one side we are making a, a stance knee flexion so make that side of limb shorter and other side pelvic dip pelvic rotation and uh, dorsiflexion to make that side of limb uh, longer so that we have an a perfect uh, heel strike without leaning and this is what interaction we should have all these things so this is how you can see that okay so you, your this is why your pelvis is center it keeps it is like rhythmic like this it is not straight okay so these are the determinants if any of these determinants are dysfunctional and are not in uh, perfect working then we will have problem with gait okay so at this point of time you must have noted that what impairment your patient has you will try to find out and you will be able to find out what impairment how to do function assessment and how to find the impairment and make your hypothesis that okay this impairment is the culprit and this impairment this problem this muscle this uh, activation pattern this functional activation pattern is the problem uh, in this patient and and i'm going to make a correction in this with the help of my techniques okay so there are key points you have to remember you have to prepare your patients lengthen your muscles because if any muscles is contracted you cannot make further contraction to that muscle okay so before you activate any muscle you have to lengthen so you have to have certain uh, uh, cueing techniques and all that so let's just understand with an one one case so one person with the left side weakness having uh, abnormality in gait infarction of cerebral uh, parieto occipital area and assessment and working hypothesis what we saw what we may made, made is she was using a base, wide base of support to sit to stand movement testing she was not able to activate her uh, quadriceps had poor stance control on involved side any in stance control was poor as i explained that is one of the determinants during gait she was leaning to uninvolved side because she was not confident in 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 affected side and and had because of poor of fall and poor stance control she was leaning on that side so now here you can see that she has a poor stance control if she, if she has a good stance control she will not lean so while correcting just stance control we can solve another different problem during walking she was leaning forward she had a poor extensor control she had also impairment in uh, taking pelvis forward as i explained so what we observe that if we can correct somehow the pelvis forward facilitation if we can achieve stance control then that definitely the gait of this person and sit to stand function will be improved okay so preparatory activity you have to have a certain um, mobilization of your scapula repositioning of the scapula and because that becomes very uh, hard you have to use soft tissue technique to mobilize and relax release the muscles okay so this is just i didn't find any good picture here it is from one of my workshop uh, to mobilize scapula and, and like in this picture like lengthening look at my leg i'm standing on leg and with one another chair i am putting here my knee flex and both the hand on uh, thighs and with one hand i am trying to pull this muscle up rotator muscles so making it lengthen so 
remember that once the muscle is contracted in position we cannot facilitate the contraction further so you have before practice before activation of muscle you have to make lengthen you can use soft tissue technique like mfr and all that but the only thing you have to remember here is while doing it should not be nociceptive it should not be painful you should should not have uh, undue um, stimulation of uh, uh, nociception so now there are few techniques which say that uh, are, um, various thing here reactive control okay so as i said that this is see the, the problem patient has a leaning problem she was not confident and she was a uh, uh, problem with leaning so there is something technique called reactive control to correct lateral deviation so as i said lateral deviation so what i am doing i am i am putting hand here see is uh, trying to lean on this side i am giving cueing from here and with back support so by this way remember one thing never push it is giving cue is not pushing so before the compensation start you have to give cue like for example you just remember somewhere you are standing in uh, some uh, cue and suddenly you find that somebody is touching you will move further nobody has said nobody has said to move further but soon you find that something is coming closer to you you get a feedback get a feedback or you just keep yourself away okay so this is what away you go this is how you have to have before the things start you have to change your um, you you have to give a cue you here you can see here from this hand you are just giving cue okay so in other way how you can give is putting your hand putting your hand and uh, giving cueing this is the another way here done something called counter <coughs> pressure front and back to improve control on for pelvic rotation as i uh, we made an a hypothesis that the pelvic control is poor so how your pelvic control is doing so look at the video here so place one hand here to prevent the leaning one side and the pelvis has to go further so you can have an a cueing that the pelvis should go further so the gait could be improved and then uh, there is a very 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 common issue in forward leaning the when patients stroke patients uh, uh, walk you you have a forward leaning to correct that you place in both hand here and have something like this you can watch in video that you can just have an by putting your hand you are guiding patient that this should not lean and the uh, extensor will get activated okay so stance control how you achieve a stance control you can do it in that way you can gain patient's confidence and you just uh, pull up the quadriceps muscles to activate and before that in sitting also in lying also you can pre activate that muscle and you start training so in this way while correcting the stance phase is a uh, good stance <coughs> we can minimize the trunk lateral deviation so this is all uh, about uh, this presentation and definitely i am very thankful to all to my student all over the world and uh, my teachers definitely i i was very lucky to have this is john moore and john moore is the i have been trained by john moore on ndt and gobad and john moore is i'm really thankful and privileged i see really like she is mother like figure for me and she is the one who was working with gobad himself and i had privilege to learn from her it is really really uh, thankful to john moore and uh, uh this is what about all about my presentation today 
And if anybody has any questions, Nehal, you can go ahead with the questions. Yeah. Thank you, sir. It was a nice presentation. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear yes. you. Yes, it was nice presentation. So there is a one question where majority people ask, what is yes. the actual difference between a Bobat and NDT? In the first slide itself, I yes. uh, explained. But still people are asking this question. There is no difference <laughs> at all. Just, there is no difference. If you don't talk about any politics in between, so there is no difference. There is a two continent and two uh, place that uh, they have a different uh, thought, they have different uh, association, they have different promotional activities, that's it. Otherwise, the core concept is the same. It, it is uh, the core is from the Bobath. And because, as I said, that there was uh, some problem with the US and the government and their, uh, the policy doesn't allow uh, at that time that some technique is named after somebody's name. So this is how it was named as a neurodevelopmental therapy. Yep. Okay. So there is no difference as such, but yes, there is a difference in uh, their uh, definitions. And uh, But in both the definitions, if you go, you will find that the way of working is same. Yeah. There are few common things in that the posture analysis movement analysis and all the things and that is all similar so don't uh, think about any differences have the core concept both are same as i understand yes right right sir so there was question is there any specific duration to promote potential in plasticity or is there any threshold for it yes definitely there are few principles of neuroplasticity there are two trend principles the repetitions matter, time matters, okay, and 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 the if specificity matters. There are the different uh, uh, principles in that. So if that, those principles says that repetitions. There are thousands and thousands of times you have to repeat certain tasks to get uh, effective potentiation. Okay, like for example, this is why now it is uh, like you see robotics. So what the technique has advantage, like we also do with NDT and other hands-on approach, also we do uh, task training like walking. And when you do this same task training in uh, some locomod and something like a uh, robotic gait trainer, so what it does, it, it increases the repetitions. In one hour of training, you can have many thousands of steps, but on ground training and manual training, we cannot achieve thousands of steps in one hour and, and we will not be able to train that. This is what the advantage of a technology here that with the robotic gear trainer, we can have a large number of reputations and that is required for having potentiation. So potentiation, to have potentiation, we have to have very number of reputations and intensity. We have to have certain intensity. Like for example, if somebody is already um, having walking and if we prescribe the exercises at lower than that uh, uh, intensity, it is not going to work. There will be no potentiation, one. Then the third thing you ask is um, uh, the uh, threshold, threshold also, also and uh, repetition threshold. Is structural, to have any structural changes, we have to have a repetition and a specificity. Like for example, if some, we cannot strengthen somebody's limb and expect that he'll be walking good. Mm. His yeah. gait will improve. No, we have to have a specific nature of training. Like, uh, like for example, some closed corridor, we have to have practice. Some open corridor, then we have to have practice. Different context, we, we have to train people. Uh, like for example, I'm training, suppose, uh, for hand activity. So I have to uh, train people to hold glass. Okay, so hold glass in standing, in sitting, right. from low height, from high height. So all these contexts we have to practice to have an a, a, actual potentiation in it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how we treat hyperextension of knee during gait cycle? 
if there is a uh, gate cycle, I, I explained that already stance control. If there is a poor stance control and poor activation of cordyceps at a stance, then the uh, knee will un, uh, go in hyperextension. So to prevent hyperextension, in mid stance position, there has to be a certain stance knee flexion. That is the determinant of gait. So if there is a no stance control, that means uh, the cordyceps activation is poor, knee is going to be in hyperextension. So work out on uh, stance control by activating cordyceps in mid stance. Okay, okay. And how much duration can after stroke onset, can we expect neuroplasticities occur in patient? It is after neuroplasticity this? is lifetime process. It occurs, it is start from the birth. <clears throat> Okay, so soon the patient, you get a stable patient, we can start activating uh, potentiation. Like even the positioning itself induce certain motor uh, neural pathway in your brain. If you adopt changes in a negative posture, then it is going to have an, a uh, depression in neuroplasticity. So very soon, just say patient uh, put, um, is stable, or, then you can start. The last one, uh, okay. Uh, tell us about prevention we should take in these techniques regarding patients when we are treating. Prevention. Prevention. Prevention in terms of what? Preventions we should take <clears throat> in these techniques, what you showed uh, regarding that patient. Yeah, that is what I prevention. Prevention, there is a, no as such prevention, but the techniques you have to have in a very accurate way, right? You learn the techniques, like as I said, that uh, while giving cue, the most people do mistake. <coughs> mistake <coughs> that they start pushing. Don't push that. Okay. So if you are just giving uh, cueing here, it should start before I lean. Okay. Okay. So this is what the techniques is. I'm giving cue here, so I I, I can make myself correct. Okay, so it is the queuing should start as soon. Uh, it has to be started before it, it occurs, that, that the dysfunction is start. Okay, okay, fine. Prevention is something you have to take care of your patient in a very right way. Don't do it in, in a way, it's a negative way, it can cause, uh, as such, there is no preventive. Things. Okay, okay. Uh, Uttara, Dr. Uttara. Yeah, you can ask. Hello? Yes. Yes, uh, Uttara. There is a question. Uh, in orthopedic conditions uh, yeah. with disability, can NDT or Bobat be useful and how it can be used? Can you give us some examples? Yes, why not? We, anywhere you can use. Whenever there is a need for activation, whenever there is a need for um, having potentiation, you can use NDT techniques or NDT or Bobat techniques wherever possible. See, one thing I always say <clears throat> that in physiotherapy or any science, there is a techniques and these therapies are restrict, not restricted to any uh, particular uh, disease or disorder. Look at the core principle. Like for example, uh, anterior knee pain. If somebody has a poor control in knee, on having patellar mal tracking, we can definitely use the NDT and BOBA techniques to have an uh, uh, activation of BMO. You can have, you can you can do that anywhere. It depends how, how what we want to achieve. Like uh, like you have to make hypothesis. Yes, anterior knee pain, and when there is a problem with the uh, knee activation. So uh, you can use entity technique to activate cordyceps muscles. No issue. Yeah. Any more question? Uh, for the counter pressure technique, how long do we apply it and any ad take home advice for the patient which they can do at home? See, it is always important to have certain activity for uh, patients, right? 
so yes we we cannot do everything a whole day treatment for patients so we have to have certain tasks practice for patients we have to design some uh, task for patient to repeatedly do at home like for example <clears throat> like for example to, uh, walking so sit to stand we can treat, uh, teach them the activation like 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 quadriceps stimuli uh, sensory stimulation they can give themselves okay certain exercises for home what principle here is as i said repetition is matter when you treat for one patient for one hour and they are going to stay 23 hour at home okay so give them certain task that the next day they come to you when you treat at least they remain in that uh, state where you left okay so the, it is important to have certain home uh, care goal like for example sit to stand you can ask them and teach them to practice sit to stand at home <clears throat> so that they can maintain the activation of plantar flexor dorsiflexors or quadriceps <clears throat> and you can give them the practice of momentum transfer at home that is also they can do it but hands on techniques you have to do it How can we improve gait in patients having a foot drop? You have to make your hypothesis why this foot drop is. Is that hyperactivation? Is that really flaccid foot drop, or it is because of hyperactivity of plantar flexor? So, if it is hyperactivity of plantar flexor, you have to have certain techniques to uh, activate the dorsiflexors and inhibit. your plantar flexor hyperactivity why it is because people he may the patient may have something poor control at trunk poor control at um, hip and knee so he is compensating he may be compensating with a strong plantar and he may have a strong plantar flexor so may be compensating to push off that to maintain his uh, prevent his fall so we have before Uh, giving a direction that what technique we have to assess that why this is why i said we have to make an a functional assessment and make an hypothesis okay so if my hypothesis is this is because he has a poor trunk control i will work out on poor control and he will be able to uh, lift his uh, do, do, uh, do, he will activate his dorsi flexors so it depends how what hypothesis you are going to have in patients using assistive devices for gait how yeah. do we uh, address the ndt approach is there any difference from those who are not using assistive device for walking okay see assistive device is sometimes very important we can allow them one thing i'll i'll tell you here there is something called kinetic chain activities right so what we are doing actually here we have to start from close kinetic chain activity open chain chain activities are very very uh, uh difficult for brain to understand like for example if i start uh, i i give clue to patient to have an a certain uh, holding activity with open hand to train that it will be difficult because at, at at i want to train the finger movement but the same times brain has to control the elbow brain has to control the shoulder everywhere so there is a wastage of resources i mean okay so what i am going to train if i want to train my hand i will stabilize the elbow first and shoulder okay so i don't want my brain to overload it to give uh, control here take care of shoulder also take care of hand elbow also so i will concentrate on my finger only hand activity okay so this is what the close kinetic and and hand uh, like for example i am training elbow so i'll make something hold in my hand okay and then do certain activity so i'm just trying to close this area i'm just trying to close this area and this area and and concentrating on my elbow so your question was to uh, how to uh, 
take care of assistive device so initially if i am trying to get an a stance control basically assistive device like stick why patient use to make base of support stronger okay so once there is a no stance control and the person is using a stick and keeping apart so basically what he is trying he is trying to create a bigger base of support so he will have a sense of security from fall if my hypothesis says that his trunk muscle his gluteal muscle his stance control is improved i can wean off that assisted device like the sticks so initially you can start with and gradually you have to try to uh, wean it off by finding out the problem as i said the problem solving you find out the problem you take care of that problem and you can remove it okay thank you sir that was the last thank question you. so any question if somebody has any more questions you can they can just put it on uh, uh, live uh, youtube channel uh, chat box and we can ask uh, answer later no issue yes sir okay so yes sir we... yes sir, yeah. yes, sir. Uh, dr priya okay uh, thank you sir uh, it's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion Uh, on behalf of the entire team i express my heartfelt thanks to dr dharam pandey sir where he mentioned all the important techniques and the principles related to the ndt the way he explained this topic was extraordinary thank you sir and you explain all the queries very uh, with the examples uh, and this is very informative knowledge i hope you all enjoy this webinar last but not least uh i thanks all the participants who attended this webinar with a great enthusiasm okay no program can be successful without our uh, organizing team so i extended my big thanks to our national head dr ruchi ma'am our zonal head dr uh, puja ma'am our motivator dr suvarna ma'am and dr snehal patel ma'am and many thanks to dr uttara ma'am and the nirali ma'am i hope you all enjoy this webinar and thank you guys for making this event successful and for your contribution thank you thank you ma'am okay thank you sir thank uh, you. kindly all participants uh, fill the feedback form the link is available in the chat box thank you sir it was wonderful session the you did the brushing of my entity also <laughs> thank you thank you yes thank you. okay